Direction in life is an interesting thing. Sometimes we're headed off in a certain direction and we have a lot of confidence and we feel that we know what we're doing and only to find that we're going in the wrong direction. I have a friend who tells this story. She was in Iowa at a conference. I believe she was in Iowa City. She found her way to Route 80. She was feeling really good about the conference, all that she'd learned, and she was thinking about it and deeply engaged in how she was going to apply it and everything. And she was just having a great old time on Route 80, which I think is hard to do, actually. And all of a sudden, she found, saw a sign for Nebraska. She'd been heading the wrong way. She went about six hours out of her way. Wow. It can happen to us. Sometimes we're just going off in the wrong direction. We have the best of intentions. We think we know what we're doing, and then we find out that we've really missed the mark. Now, I suppose it's possible that we sometimes see the signs and we just don't believe them. I mean, I suppose it's possible that this friend of mine saw that sign in Nebraska and said, that can't be right. I'm going east. I don't know why they put that sign for Nebraska up there, and she could have kept going all the way to Colorado. Seen the sign for Colorado and said, that can't be right. No, sometimes we are stubborn. But redirection is the crux of the story today. This is what happened to King David in our story. David has reached the top. His life is coming together. He has a sense of direction and purpose. He knows who he is. And Eugene H. Peterson puts it this way, everything is working for David. He has put the Philistines in their place he has consolidated the country impressively. He has set up the new capital in Jerusalem. He has recaptured the Ark of the Covenant, brought it into Jerusalem. Everything is going well. Things are moving. It's a great time. And the chapter of 2 Samuel marks this theological center in the books of First and 2 Samuel. Here David is able to make use of the very important symbols of his faith, of his religion, the symbol of the Ark of the Covenant, and so on. But of course, the Ark of the Covenant was a symbol of God's presence during the time in which the people were wandering in the wilderness. Now they are settled. And what does it mean that God is with them in this setting when they're not relying upon God each day to lead them as they had in the wilderness, when God led them by the pillar of cloud of light at night and, and the glory cloud during the day, and they depended upon God each and every step of the way to be led through this wilderness. Now they are settled. And in this mindset, David has a plan. He wants to build a temple for God. Sounds like a great idea, a way to give God the glory, a way to express the new settled community in David's new city, which he has set up uniting the northern and southern kingdoms, Jerusalem, the city of peace. In some ways, it's a political move because the temple would solidify the sense of God's presence in the new capital, David's capital, David's city, the city of David, you remember. But it's certainly not just political. David, in his enthusiasm and zeal, wants to honor God. He wants to do something beautiful for God. He wants to express his devotion to God. But as it so happens, this very good idea is not the right idea, and it's not God's idea. It happens to us a lot. We have our plans. We have so many good things in mind, and sometimes the many good things that we're doing get in the way of the best thing or the right thing or what God has for us. We discover that God has another purpose altogether, and this is our story. David is pretty sure he has it right. I mean, what could be wrong with building a temple to solidify the faith in the new city? So he calls in the prophet, and the prophet Nathan says, great idea, let's build the temple. And that night, Nathan has the dream, as we heard in the scriptures, and receives a message from God. And God says, have I ever asked for a house? Has that been a request that I have made? Do I want a temple? Remember, I wandered in the wilderness with you and went with you, and the Ark of the Covenant was the symbol of my presence with you. And it suggests to me, the temple suggests to me a kind of a restriction on God. I don't know if you see it this way, but an almost an inhibition. Oh, now we have God, and we have God located and contained in a particular place, in a particular way. But underneath it, 
God will be God, and God chooses to go where God will go. And God is engaged with people in the journey of life, never to be contained in any way, even though we would like to be able to locate God and to contain him and to know where God is. Of course, it became a problem down the road when Solomon built the temple in Jesus' day. It was an even larger problem. But God is a free being. This is a part of the story, but this is the, in sense, the uh, negative part of the story, the part that was not to happen. But then we have the redirection, the part that God is going to accomplish in and through David. And God is going to establish a royal lineage through David. And so we have a play on the word house. God does not want a house, a building. God wants to build a house, a people. God wants to build a lineage, and Christ will be a part of the lineage of David from the house of David. Now, at first, David needs to be reminded of who he is before God can do anything with him, before he can, before he can realize the grander plan. He needs to, to be humbled. He needs to get off his high horse, in a sense. And so God, through Nathan, reminds David that he was just a shepherd boy, and God pulled him out of that station, and God guided him each and every step along the way and helped him during the years in which he wandered in the wilderness, and God has established him as king and brought him through the days of the war with the Philistines and all of that. God has been working in David's life. Perhaps David couldn't see it. I mean, during so many days of his life, if you read the book of First Samuel, it's it's pretty much one disaster after another. I mean, he's living in the house of Saul, who's basically, the first king of Israel was basically a crazy man. David's living with a crazy man in this crazy house. And then he's, he's hunted down by Saul's army for years, some say nine years, so he's hunted down by this crazy man. He's supposedly the anointed, but for 15 years he's just subjected to the first king of Israel, Saul. It seems perhaps to David that he's been abandoned. But now David is doing well. He says, I live in a house of cedar and God lives in a tent. Oh, right, David. Poor God. Poor God lives in a tent. You know, the Bible says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The skies are his canopy. Oh, yeah, God lives in a tent. Sure, David. Good argument. David is getting a little swelled up. God does not live in a tent. David is just about to cross the line from being full of God to full of himself. Outwardly, everything is the same, but David is getting high on his horse, having defeated the enemy, having established the capital, and ready to build the royal city. That is not God's direction. David's plan or plans are subject to a higher will. He knows that, but he has forgotten. And the whole experience now writes his thinking again and brings him into the right place. As we will see next week, as we look at the second half of the chapter, David comes around and offers up a humble prayer, acknowledging that God has been the one who has brought him to this place, the place that God has been with him all of his days. That God has has brought him there. I wonder what the experiences of your life are, how God has been reminding you or how God has reminded you that he has been leading you in the past. What are the, the markers? How do you know when you stop and think about it? What stops you? What causes you to think, yes, God really is in my life. How do you know? I have a friend who's struggling with that in the ministry. He says, God doesn't really guide individuals. He's a pastor, he's a good pastor. I know him quite well. He says, God doesn't work in the life of individuals. I said, really? What do you preach? He says, well, God just works in communities, not in individuals. So I never talk about individual guidance with regard to individuals. So I said, that's too bad. And I worry about him a little bit. Some years ago, I had an experience in Glen Ellen I want to share with you. It was a kind of an unusual experience. I'd been there for about two or three years, I think, and and I was beginning to get that feeling that pastors often get in the church, or I suppose all of you get in your life, and what am I doing here? What, how did I get here? You know, and you just kind of wonder if you made the decision, or you know, God made it, or somebody else made it, or the calling committee made a mistake, or 
whatever, you know, and, and you're there. And, and I went into the chapel and I was praying, and as I, as I sat down the steps, I had the most amazing experience. And I, as I sat in the steps of the chapel, which was the original sanctuary of that church, and I sat there, and I remembered a time 15 years before where I had sat in that exact same spot, and I'd been on a mission trip, a youth mission trip, and we were going out to Colorado. That was a disaster trip. I'm not going to tell you about that. But on the way, we stopped to see Chicago because I thought for sure the kids would want to see Chicago. They had no interest. And we got to this church in Glen Ellen. I went upstairs to get away from the kids and to sit in the chapel and to say a prayer. And while I was sitting there in the chapel, I had this distinct sense that God was going to call me to that church, and I was going to be there someday. And I remember thinking, oh, no, I don't want to be here. I don't like it here. I certainly hope this isn't the voice of the Lord. Fifteen years later, I'm sitting in the same spot, not having remembered that all these years, and the memory comes back to me as distinctly as you can imagine. An assurance that God somehow is working in my life even though I don't get it and I don't see it. It was an amazing experience. What struck me this week as I studied this passage is that God is guiding us, but we have to be open, we have to be humble, and the caution is that we have to be careful when we get too high on our horse and we're caught up in a wave of success. Then there are the communal lessons here as well, and this is where my pastor friend would no doubt come down, and there are two lessons about uh, communal application. Walter Brueggemann, the great biblical commentator, says that this section of the Bible is the turning point in the life of David and, in a sense, in the turning point in the life of the nation Israel. The text indicates a major change going forward. Up until now, the blessing of God was contingent upon the keeping of the law. That is, if the people were obedient to God then they would be blessed. But now the text says that it is not about obedience, but about God's grace. Obedience is important, yes, but the blessing will not depend upon the obedience of the people. In other words, this is a turn towards justification by grace. This is looking forward to the New Testament. And we have this play on the word house, that God is building a house, a legacy. And the text says that God does not want a house but that God wants a people, and God is building a people of permanence. And furthermore, something has changed, and God will not take away his blessing. His covenantal love, his chesed love toward the people, will not be removed. It was removed from Saul. God took away his blessing from Saul, but God will not take away his blessing from David. The son cannot be punished by the father. This is because David is the forefather of the coming Christ. And so in a sense, the scripture leaps forward in time and we see the the possibility of justification by grace. God has done something for David far greater than he can imagine. David is very caught up in the symbols of the day, but God is much more concerned about what he is accomplishing in history. And there's no longer an if here, but the but of grace The verse 15 says triumphantly, but my love will never be taken away from you as I took it away from Saul when I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure before you forever. Your throne will be established forever. This is not a blank check for David to do whatever he wants, but it's the promise of God through David to accomplish God's will. And so this morning we can look back and see God's faithfulness and what's been established through the years. A friend of mine says that no matter how much life messes up, and believe me, he he has succeeded in messing his life up in amazing ways. He's a great guy, but he's one of these guys that just stumbles along and does stuff. Got himself arrested for a white-collar crime, was thrown in prison for a few years, and He just is like that, you know. He's a great guy, but sometimes his enthusiasm throws him into dangerous places. But his favorite scripture is from Romans chapter 8, and he says, There is nothing that can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus my Lord. And he says it all the time. He says, well, you know, nothing can separate me from the love of God. 
in Christ Jesus, my Lord. He believes in grace. He really does. There's a second reason for hopefulness this Sunday, less than a week after the election of the president, and that is that God is involved in the affairs of humanity. God is involved in human institutions. God is involved in all of life. God is involved in government. Really? It's an interesting text because here the religious and the political come together in the person of David. At this juncture in the history of Israel, God is working in David's life and in David, through David, in Israel, and through Israel to the world. You can't separate them. You cannot separate in this text and in most of the Old Testament political history from religious history. It's all a part of the same thing because God is involved in history. God is intervening in history. God is involved with real people. Every move David makes is both political and religious at this point. This is pretty hard for us to grasp in the modern setting. It just doesn't work that way. We have nothing like this. We don't really experience it this way, understandably. We have things extremely compartmentalized. We have morality over here. We have progress over here. We have religion over here, government over here, and never the twain shall meet. Religion and government, never the twain shall meet. Separation of church and state has become so extreme. It was set up so that the church would be protected from the state, not the state protected from the church. And now there are many who want to protect the state from the church. Really? In this period, do you think the state is endangered by the church? Or do you think the church has no influence whatsoever on the state? In our text, there's a combination of high faith and the interests of the public life. The writer is saying that God is involved in the political sphere and that God is involved in the creation of justice in human institutions. It's hard for us to imagine in the modern world because we face this huge separation. But here it is in biblical history, the example of God's purposes working in the historical situation, and David establishing the capital, and these things I've talked about, in the bringing in the Ark of the Covenant, and all of these things in the text, working through David, setting up Jerusalem as the new city. And so it brings me to these reflections. I'm not very politically astute, uh, so I step out somewhat hesitantly. But why not? I'm an interim pastor, right? <laughs> oh, that was a cop-out. <laughs> but it reminds me of my sister Susan once when my grandmother came, and she said, Susan, you're so astute. And she said, I am not a stoop. So I don't want to be a stoop. But rather, I have a hope, and my first hope is that to reiterate that of David Brooks, the consultant for the News Hour on PBS. And David Brooks this week said, we all need to take pause. You know, the media has been rather inflated uh, over the last year, and uh, they appear to know what they're talking about, and they certainly analyze things to death, but they have been humbled. They have been humbled. It's an opportunity for all of us to take pause and ask, what, is the American, what are the American people wanting? What is really being said? Maybe difficult to know, but certainly take pause and say a prayer. Secondly, the compartmentalization of the political conversation needs to stop and gets us into huge trouble. We need to see the interrelation of things. It's a big country, and there are reasons for why we are where we are, why we're here. History has brought us here. We're grounded in history. But there's wisdom and there's moral judgment and there's the possibility for humility. It's my hope that people will begin to think in politics again and their thinking will be comprehensive and comprehensible and they'll have a vision and not just sound bites. You know, we get a lot of jabs. It's like a boxing match this year, right? Jab, 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 gotcha, gotcha. Where's the vision? Where's the depth? Where's the wisdom? Where's the understanding? Where's the desire for the public good? 
And where is the Christian voice? You know, it's going to be very easy for the church to say, oh, how sad. It's so sad we can't do anything. It's so sad we're left out of this. Or we can try to be more involved, and we can invite the younger generation to be more involved. I think it's possible that the younger generation will be more involved. I think the younger ge generation is going to need to be more involved. I mean, we have an increasingly secular society. If the younger generation is not more involved, bringing Christian values to the, to the political realm and to the greater picture in this country, then, then where will we be? We'll just be more secular. We need young people who are encouraged to be involved in politics. So if you're under 25, that's you. <laughs> we need you to be in politics. This isn't the voice of God, but we really do need you. Leadership that models wisdom gleaned from history and reason. We're not Israel. The kingdom of God is not going to come through the United States of America. The kingdom of God is not going to come through America. We are not a Christian nation. However, we have the word of God. We've received wisdom. We've learned through the ages. We have a great deal to offer. Perhaps the separation of church and state has gone too far and the church no longer has a voice among politicians. I hope that is not so because we are in need of leadership in this country and we are in need of leadership badly. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your love and we thank you for your covenantal love which does not desert us or abandon us at any time and that through Christ our Lord we can stand on a confident and firm foundation knowing your salvation, that we are justified by grace through faith because we have come to faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. You will never abandon us or leave us and we cannot be separated from the love of God. We stand firm on that. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.